We'll finish this section with a couple of tricky concepts, modeling architecture and muscle tendon interaction. I'll take you through the details here pretty quickly. To get this, it really will take some time going through the book, doing some homework problems, and doing some open sim exercises. And together, the lecture, the homeworks, the open sim things, you'll get it for sure. So let's talk about modeling muscle tendon architecture. So just some engineering terminology. What I have here is normalized force versus normalized length. And we have some parameters for active force and for passive force as well as the force velocity property of muscle. What we want to do now is to be able to compute the force in muscle. So the force in muscle is a function of its activation, of its normalized length, and normalized velocity. So if I want to calculate muscle force, the holy grail in biomechanics, I just need to know three things. Activation, length, and velocity. So let's expand that a little bit. We can calculate this by, from things that we know and can estimate. So the muscle force is a function of these three, but we can just take the peak isometric force of muscle, and we'll know that for each muscle activation, and remember for activation we're going to get a number between 0 and 1. 0 is inactive, 1 is maximally active, and our muscles operate between those two ranges. So this activation will be a number between 0 and 1. We'll also have what we call a force length multiplier. That is also going to be a number between 0 and 1, and it's basically the y-axis of this curve. So depending on where we are in the length of the muscle, we'll get a number for the force length multiplier for active force here. The th third term in this segment of the equation is the force velocity multiplier. And given a normalized velocity, whether the muscle is shortening or lengthening, we can get this force velocity multiplier here. Now, key is that's active muscle force we also have to add in the passive muscle force. We have this separated out because the passive muscle force is not dependent on the activation. So we have activation times force length times force velocity plus this passive force. And given that, we can estimate the force in any muscle at any time during a movement. Quite a powerful technique. So what does this look like in 3D? So far we've been looking at these 2D curves but it's really a 3D curve. So let's take the example. So here's the force length velocity activation relationship. And let's take the example where activation is one. That's what we've been assuming so far. We'd look at our force length curve, our force velocity curve. These are maximum forces, so activation is one. And this is plotted here, the force you'll get out of muscle versus its normalized velocity and normalized length. So you can see the force length curve here. You can see the force velocity curve here. So for a given length and velocity, you can go into this curve. And for a maximum activation, you can interpolate that. If you slice through it, you can see the force length curve here and force velocity curve here. Now, muscle is almost never maximally activated. It's usually somewhere less than that. In light activities, it might be just 10%. In a serious exertion, different muscles will have different activations, but you can imagine 60, 70, 80, or even 100%. So you can create this family of surfaces where here activation is zero, here activation is one, and I've just drawn two curves that are intermediate muscle activations, one third and two thirds here. So you can imagine muscle being computed as a function of its activation, of its length, and of its velocity. Not pictured here is the passive curve. Don't forget the passive curve. It's up here, and I didn't want to clutter this picture by showing it here. Again, you can review this in the book and get a sense for what this is. So let's talk just briefly to conclude about muscle-tendon interactions. Tendon compliance affects muscle length and muscle velocity. I'll just show you muscle length here. And that effect depends on the architecture of muscle.
So let's say I have a muscle that has a certain set of fibers, but it has a short, rigid tendon. I then excite that muscle, so the muscle's now generating force because the tendon is so short, it's essentially rigid, it doesn't stretch much. So the muscle length doesn't change much because the tendon doesn't stretch. The fibers and tendon are in series, and if the tendon stretches, the fibers will shorten. And that's exactly what we see here. Remember, tendon is like a nonlinear spring. So in this other muscle tendon complex, we have a long compliant tendon. And now when I activate that, shown with the signified in the orange circumference there, the tendon stretches. When that muscle tendon length stays the same and the tendon stretches, the fibers actually shorten. So the, the muscle fiber length went from here to here. So you're going to get a different length and a different force. So that's the isometric conditions where the muscle tendon length is held constant. But remember during movement, the muscle tendon length is going to be almost constantly changing and force will be changing. So the tendon stretch will be changing. And that's why we use open sim to do simulations of muscle tendon dynamics because while we can reason about this static case pretty easily, when you get many muscles working together in a dynamic sense and they all have different architectures, different tendon lengths, different fiber lengths, we really need a computer simulation to take all of that into account. Okay, so how might we do that? We've talked about generic muscle and tendon properties, as if every muscle were the same. But we also talked about muscle architecture, some short fibers, some long fibers, some big cross-sectional area, some small cross-sectional area. And we can take into account almost every muscle in the body with our generic model by scaling it to rep represent a particular muscle tendon complex. So, for example, here's a dimensionless model. So it's a dimensionless force by a dimensionless length. But I can scale that to a particular muscle. How do I do that? If I know the peak force in muscle, I can add the peak force right here. So its peak force will be the physiologic cross-sectional area multiplied by the specific tension. So I'll know the peak force. I'll know the optimal fiber length. If I have those two parameters, I can take this dimensionless generic model and scale it to a particular muscle. I can do that for pretty much any muscle in the body. For tendon, it's useful to have these relationships that I'll put these up on the slide. They're also in your book. And when you're making computations, uh, you can take this into account. So to model tendon, a specific tendon, you need to specify the dimensionless properties of tendon, that's the force length curve, and two parameters, the peak isometric force of muscle and the tendon slack length. I'm scaling tendon by the peak isometric force of muscle. What does that mean? It means if the muscle gets bigger, it can generate a larger force, so it needs a larger tendon. So in our dimensionless muscle tendon model, we're scaling the tendons by the size of the muscle. That's roughly what happens. Bigger muscles have thicker tendons that can bear more load. We're essentially assuming the strain in every tendon at a certain percentage max is the same between all muscle tendon complexes in the body. Not a perfect assumption, but it lets us take a generic model and scale it to any different muscle tendon complex. Some other useful relationships. We've covered uh, a couple of these so far, but knowing the strain in tendon is the stretch in tendon divided by the tendon stack slack length. The stress in tendon is the force in tendon over area of tendon. And if we're using a linear model, the force in tendon, you, if you can determine a stiffness of tendon, it's just the stretch in tendon times the stiffness of tendon. The stretch in tendon is the elastic modulus times strain in tendon. And we use these parameters as just defaults when we're making calculations. That is, the stress in tendon, when the muscle's developing its maximum force, we're going to assume is 30 megapascals. That lets you scale the muscle and tendon together.
and the strain in tendon when muscle is developing its maximum force is about 0.05, so about 5%. Tendon ruptures at about 10%. If it's strained 5% when the muscle's developing its maximum force, what that suggests is you have a factor of safety of about two. If you could generate twice as much force, you'd break the tendon. It's a rough assumption. It's been tested and varies uh, from 3% to 7%, so we're gonna use 5% in our calculations here. Or to be very specific, 4.9%. Uh, okay, so with those relationships, you can take uh, a generic property of a muscle and a tendon and scale that to rep represent a particular tendon given its length and the peak force of muscle. So if we want to model all muscle tendon properties for any muscle, what do we need to know? We need four curves, the active force length curve of muscle, the passive force length of curves of muscle, the active force velocity curve, and the tendon force length curve. We also need the material properties that are the same, that are generic, for all muscle tendon actuators. Then if we want to model a specific muscle tendon complex, we need four specific properties. Optimal fiber length, peak force, pination angle, and tendon slack length. That's it. So we can model any muscle with those four parameters. Now if we wanted to model the dynamic properties, we also need a peak velocity. And that might depend on how much slow twitch and fast twitch. That we can get into a little bit later. But it's a powerful approach to take a generic muscle tendon complex and scale it to represent any muscle in the body. So I've given you some powerful tools for understanding muscle, for understanding tendon, and modeling muscle tendon statics and dynamics. I encourage you to go on, uh, use OpenSim, and keep these conceptual models in your mind, and you'll begin to learn more and more about how muscles work to produce movement.